summer of 2013. My girlfriend and I are on holidays in Greece. We're walking around in Athens. We're looking for the Lyceum, the school where Aristotle used to teach over 2,000 years ago. We found the site, but it was closed. It was not yet open to the public. Archaeologists were busy excavating. Fortunately, I spoke some Greek. I talked to the warden who let us in. So I was able to walk on what remained of the stoa. I was able to touch the stones of what remained of its columns and its walls. What was I doing there? I was looking for wisdom. I was looking for the wisdom of Aristotle that we need today. We're making a mess as humanity. We have untethered neoliberalism. We kill animals for food. We burn fossil fuels. We've created a climate crisis. It was 40 degrees Celsius in the Netherlands. This should scare the hell out of you. I'm also deeply worried about the ways in which companies and governments use artificial intelligence, AI, to multiply their powers, to monitor and control people. We have fake news, polarization, and out of hand inequality. We need to live differently. Here's an idea. Our actions are shaped by our thoughts. And our thoughts are shaped by everything that we do online and digitally. And that's increasingly controlled by AI. Now, if we reverse that, if we change how we use AI, we can change how we think, we can change how we live. We can live differently. In Athens, I found three words that Aristotle used. Polis, telos, and ethos. We can use these three words to use AI and indeed any technology as a tool to promote human flourishing and most urgently to combat the climate crisis. Let me take you back in time to Aristotle's Athens and let us excavate these three words and wipe the sand off. Aristotle's teachings focus on living together in a polis in a city, we are zoon politicon, social animals, we are meant to live together. Now, unfortunately, that idea got lost during the Enlightenment. We now incorrectly believe that we're independent individuals. Of course, I know that Aristotle's time was different from ours. That's why we need to rethink the polis for our time. A growing group of people is doing exactly that. They're developing a human-centered approach to technology to uphold human dignity, human rights, and values like freedom, equality, and solidarity. Let me introduce you to four or five people that do that. The first is data scientist Katie O'Neill. In her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, she writes about many ways in which algorithms produce and reproduce injustices in employment, in education, and in the criminal justice system. I read this book, it was a wake-up call. It's a catalog of all the injustices. She urges us to cultivate the virtue of justice in how we use algorithms. Another example, Sherry Turkle of MIT. She has studied the ways in which people interact with technologies for over 30 years. In her latest book, Reclaiming Conversation, she writes with insight and empathy about our declining abilities to communicate with each other. She reminds us to cultivate the virtue of civility, our ability to live together in a polis. You see a picture of rain. Let me ask you a very simple question. Why does it rain? <clears throat> Maybe in your head is now an answer that goes something like this. Well, uh, Water evaporates, turns into clouds, the temperature drops, and then the cloud turns into rain. Yes, that is an answer to the question, where does rain come from? Aristotle, however, would listen to this question differently. Aristotle believed that everything has a purpose, a telos, and strives towards his telos. Why does it rain? What is the purpose of rain? It rains so that plants can grow and can feed animals and people. That idea, however, was 
also lost during the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was all about means and mechanics. More growth, more control, more of the same. A mechanistic worldview. I remember vividly, over 20 years ago, John Thackera, an internet pioneer on stage, putting it succinctly like this. The internet is really great, but what is it for? He wants us to focus on ends, not on means. Asking a question like that requires the courage, the virtue of courage. A careful balance between hope and fear in how we relate to technology. A balance between utopia and dystopia. Another example, Tristan Harris. He used to work at Google. And to his horror, he realized that YouTube is not a tool for people to watch videos. It is not. It is a tool for advertisers to grab and hold people's attention as often as possible and as long as possible. So he quit Google. He founded the Center for Humane Technology. They developed a range of strategies to help cultivate the virtue of self-control. Yes, we can train ourselves to switch off our phones. We can take control of technology so that it empowers us rather than enslaves us. Third word, ethos, translates into virtue. Aristotle urged the citizens of Athens to cultivate a range of classical virtues. And that may sound archaic, and it is. Fortunately, we have an update. Shannon Veller wrote the book Technology and the Virtues. In it, with much wisdom, she discusses a range of techno-moral virtues for the 21st century that we need today to flourish as a people. You can think of a virtue as a superpower. Each of you has a unique set of superpowers. Now, possibly some of these superpowers are somewhat hidden. Probably you will need to cultivate these superpowers. Cultivating a superpower, a virtue, involves the alignment of your thinking, your feeling, and your acting. An alignment of your head, your heart, and your hands. In closing, I'd like to wrap up and review both classical and contemporary virtues slash superpowers. We've already seen justice and civility, which you need to create a polis in which people can live together. We've already seen courage and self-control, which you need to develop to your full human potential, your telos. In addition, you can think of superpowers like creativity or curiosity or collaboration that you need, for example, in design and innovation. Superpowers like humility, care or compassion that you need in projects that aim to promote the greater good or something else. My superpower is curiosity. So I like to ask questions. My question to you is, what is your superpower? And as a 30-second experiment, I'd like to invite you for a short meditation. You can please close your eyes. Take a deep breath, inhale. And exhale slowly, maybe even make sounds. Be aware of your body, your feet, your arms. Feel into your body. Now imagine yourself in your daily life, in your work, Maybe a project that you work on. And now, imagine yourself with one superpower added. One extra superpower. What is it? What is your superpower? Take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale slowly. Now you can open your eyes. Make eye contact with somebody standing next to you. And then one of you starts. You can figure it out quickly. And then you say, my superpower is, and then you say it. Please, you can do that now. <laughs> and then um, I'm just... I'm just guessing that 
the other person has also had his turn or her turn. Excellent. The other person has also said the superpower, right? Okay. <laughs> I love it. You're great participants in this experiment. Thank you. A last question. So you've identified your superpower, you've said something, the other person said some, something. Now I'd like to close with a question. How will you, in your daily life, in your work, in your projects, cultivate this superpower? What will you do tomorrow, next week, next month? Thank you. <laughs>